Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you our cosmic corraller, the lunar lander, the alien ambassador, and our ETMC for the evening, Professor Clint Sprott. <laughs> Welcome to the wonders of physics. Now, you know I wasn't really traveling around through the solar system in my rocket ship, right? right? But I did want to get you in the mood to learn about physics of the cosmos. Because the year 2009 is the International Year of Astronomy, celebrating its contributions to society and to culture. It's also the 400th anniversary of the first use of the telescope by Galileo. Here's a picture of me with Galileo many years ago. <laughs> but you know, it didn't seem quite right for it to, to just be an international celebration. So we thought we would do something a little bit different this year. Instead of my doing all the demonstrations, as I've done for many, many years, we thought we would invite visitors from some of our neighboring planets to come and tell you about physics in their part of the solar system. And our first visitor is from the planet Mars. Now, as you know, Mars is the fourth planet in the solar system. Uh, it's sometimes called the red planet. It's about half the size of the Earth, and it has about one-third of Earth's gravity. Uh, it also has very little atmosphere. Its atmosphere is only about 1% as dense as the atmosphere here on the Earth, and it's made up mainly of carbon dioxide. Now, Mars is the planet that's the most studied, and it's the most like the Earth. It resembles the desert of Arizona. But it gets very cold there. It reaches a temperature of only as about 20 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. And at night, it can get as cold as 120 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Now, as you know, there are plans to send humans to Mars. So we thought it would be good to invite a Martian to come and tell us what to expect when we get there. So give a welcome to our Martian visitor, Kukus Klukus. <laughs> Oh, Professor Sprott, there's a little problem. The gravity here is way stronger than I imagined. Hmm. I don't know if I can go on with my presentation. Well, that could be a problem, but I have a solution for you. You do? Yep. A balloon. A balloon. Let's just hook this to you and see if that helps. OK, I'll be willing to try it. But... How's that? Well, I think it's working, but I'm kind of lopsided now. Well, we'll just give you a second balloon. OK. No problem. How about that? You know what? I think that might actually work. Thank you, Professor Sprott. I can go on with my presentation. Yeah, I think I can. OK, well, uh, I'm so excited to be here with you today. Um, as you know, I am from Mars. And I'm really excited about the idea of Earthlings coming to visit us someday. So I want to tell you everything you need to know to get to Mars safely. And the first thing is that you need to know where Mars is. Now, you know, Mars isn't always in the same place. It's a moving target, right? It's always you know, orbiting around the sun. So how are you supposed to figure out where it is? Well, and one concept that helps you is the idea of inertia. And inertia says that objects in motion tend to stay in motion, and objects at rest tend to stay at rest. So here, I have an object at rest. I have this tablecloth underneath this beaker. And do you think that I can get that tablecloth out from under the beaker without it moving? You think I can? All right, let's give it a try. We'll see what happens. One, two, three. Am I doing something wrong? OK, what am I doing wrong? Going too slow. So you think I should do it faster. So what's actually going on here? There's a force um, between here. So objects in, at rest only stay at rest if there are no forces acting on them. And there's a force of friction between this tablecloth and the beaker. But if I pull fast enough, I should break that force of friction. And I think that I might be able to uh, get this out from underneath the beaker. OK. So here we go. I'm going to try it again. One, two, three. There we go. So 
That is an object at rest. And here, uh, I'm going to show you an object in motion. So this is a ball. And when I'm talking about motion, I'm talking about straight line motion. So if I roll this ball across the floor, you can see it starts in a straight line and it keeps on going in a straight line because there are no forces acting on it. But this isn't what the planets do, is it? The planets move in circles, right? So there must be a force acting on them, and that force is called gravity. Right. So there is uh, a force of gravity because of the sun. Now here I have a model of the solar system. I've got the sun over here. I've got Mars over here. And I have this string connecting them that represents gravity. Now I have this blade. And I'm going to raise that blade and cut off gravity. And I want you to predict what's going to happen. Now remember, inertia says that objects in motion like to stay in straight line motion when there's no force acting. So I've got gravity going on here. I've got Mars in orbit. Now, now, I want you to think about what's going to happen when gravity gets cut off. You may start to rise out of your seat, so be uh, prepared for that. Here we go. Cutting off gravity. All right. So straight line motion, like we said. So I'm going to do a demonstration of the conservation of energy. And for this one, I'm going to need a volunteer. But I need a very brave volunteer that believes in the conservation of energy, OK? How about you right here? Come with me. What's your name? Scarlett. Scarlett, OK. Thank you for volunteering. I want you to come over here. Uh, Peter's going to help me with this one. Um, could you come over to this uh, ladder and sit on the top rung there? Now, this demonstration is completely safe. What's going to happen is uh, I'm going to have Scarlett just let go of this bowling ball, and it's going to swing out. And when it swings back, the law of conservation of energy says that there is no way that it can come up to a higher point than it started. So this is going to get a little scary, but it's going to be completely safe. So are we all ready for this? We're going to do a countdown together. We're going to say 3, 2, 1, release. OK? Ready over here? Yep. 3, 2, 1, release. Be brave, Scarlett. There you go. So that is the conservation of energy. Thank you so much for your help. So ask any astronomer. They'll be able to tell you the best time to go to Mars, um, thanks to these physical laws. And that's all I have prepared to say to you today. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Professor Sprott, for inviting me. Um, but I see I have these balloons that you gave me, and I should really probably give them back to you before I leave. Well, we don't need them back, but I have an idea. What do you think is in these, these balloons? Helium. Helium? Are helium? you sure? Yes. Yeah. Hydrogen. hydrogen. How could we tell whether it's hydrogen or helium? What? Light a stick on fire? <laughs> You're sure? Well, that's true, because helium, as you know, doesn't burn. It's a so-called inert gas, whereas hydrogen burns explosively. W wait. You sure this is a good idea? Well, let's see. OK. It okay. didn't burn, did it? Would you like to see it again? Yeah. OK. OK. That, that wasn't so bad the first time. No, of course not. We'll do it with the second balloon. OK. You notice Mr. Wikes with his fingers in his ears? What? If loud noises bother you, you may want to do the same. <laughs> well, you know, Professor Sprott, he seemed kind of tall for a Martian. You know, I thought Martians were these little green men. No, no, that's a total myth. Martians are not little green men. Martians grow to be very tall because uh, there's very little gravity there. If you ever think you see a little green man, you're imagining things. Anyway, our next visitor is from the planet Mercury, which, as you know, is the smallest of the planets and it's the closest to the sun. Now, you might think it gets very hot there. And of course, it does. It gets to a temperature of 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. But the day is very long on Mercury. It lasts about 176 Earth days. And so there's a very long night. And during the night, because there's very little atmosphere on Mercury, it gets very cold, reaching a temperature of 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Now, Mercury is about the same size as our moon. And it has many craters. And it has very little gravity. Peter, would you bring out our visitor for Mercury, Mercurio Rochuso? Yes, Professor Sprott. He's back here sleeping. 
I think he had a long trip. Seems like he's kind of tired. I bet you he's got a lot of space leg. Mercurio! Mercurio, wake up! Wake up, oh. Mercurio! Oh. Well, you're, you're on! Not... You're on! Oh. Oh, you... You're on! You woke me up. I was hibernating. I mean, it's, it's really cold in here. <laughs> it's not cold in here. It's 70 degrees. Exactly. I mean, I'm used to like 600 degrees. Come on. Hmm. Can we, can we at least turn up the thermostat to like... I don't know, 350? <laughs> I don't think 350 would work for, well, the, <laughs> for us. You know, Earthlings. Mercury isn't just really hot. You know, the dark side of Mercury, the side that's facing away from the sun, can get really cold, like Professor Sprott said. We don't really have seasons on Mercury. It's either really hot or really, really cold. So it's like Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I feel at home. All right. So, well, Professor Sprott, since you woke me from my slumber, I might as well do some demonstrations that'll uh, kind of remind me of, of Mercury. And I brought me something. I brought uh, something with me that uh, reminds me of the the cold side of Mercury. And I brought something called liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen. It's a liquid that is 321 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. That's its boiling point. So what I'm going to do? I'm gonna, let's do a few experiments with it. I'm going to scoop some up and I'm going to put it in this cylinder. I'm going to use my little cup here, scoop some up, <laughs> drop it in, and I'm going to hammer a cork on. And pressure's going to build up inside. <laughs> and So pressure built up inside and eventually the cork blew off because of the boiling liquid nitrogen. Let's do another one about liquid nitrogen. Let's see. Ooh, what do we got here? Oh, I need a volunteer. This is a bag of marshmallows, one of your favorite earthling treats, and I need a volunteer to uh, verify for the rest of the audience that these are in fact regular old marshmallows. Let's have one of those big ones there. Yes? They are marshmallows, Thank you. yes, and marshmallows are usually like soft and kind of squishy and, and, you know, chewy. Well, let's see what happens to a marshmallow when you put it in liquid nitrogen. Because when things change temperature, their properties can change as well. So I'm just going to pour some liquid nitrogen in my little glass full of a few marshmallows here. And I'm going to let them get nice and chilly. And we're going to do an experiment to see how the properties of these marshmallows have changed. Let me pull out this table here and get it cleared off. And uh, I'm going to take one out. And I'm going to use that hammer that I used before to see how these marshmallows has changed. Let's see. Put it right there. Give it a little whack. And it shatters. All right, let's do one more with, uh, with liquid nitrogen. Um, I have a balloon here. Don't worry, it's a helium balloon, I promise. <laughs> and of course, helium balloons float in air. Uh, but let's see what happens when we cool down the temperature of the helium inside. So I'm just going to take this balloon, and I'm going to pour some liquid nitrogen on it. Let's see. Let's watch very closely to see what happens to the balloon. It shrivels up and shrinks, and it loses its buoyancy. But it will warm up slowly. And go back up. As it warms up, the helium expands again to fill the balloon and it becomes less dense than air once more. But it doesn't go up all the way to the ceiling. Why is that? The What's stopping it? Yeah, the string. The string is attached to it, so it's not going all the way up. I have an idea. Suppose we cut the string right where it touches the table. OK, let's see. Oh, let's see, I'll get it here. Right about there. OK. 
And then we have a balloon that's just capable of supporting the weight of the string, and it should go neither up nor down. Oh. Now, that's something you can't do on Mercury. Thanks, Professor Sprott. That's pretty Maybe I should cut off a tiny bit more. <laughs> Let's see. You've got to get Try it that. just right. Try that. Aha. Uh -huh. Cool. Cool. Let's go a little boost here, and we'll let it float around. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so let's do a, a Professor Sprout mentioned that I wouldn't be able to do this on, on Mercury because Mercury has no atmosphere. Mercury has no atmosphere. So if I took that helium balloon to Mercury, what would it do? You think it would float away? No, it would it would crash to the ground and it would sit there on the ground. Since Mercury has no atmosphere. Professor Sprout, what is the atmospheric pressure here here on Earth? Oh, here on the Earth, we have 14.7 pounds per square inch. 14.7 pounds per square inch? That's ridiculous. That's a lot of pressure. Well, while I'm here on Earth, I need, I need to take advantage of this and do some experiments with it. Um, <laughs> Mr. Wikes, would you help me with this one? I brought with me two, uh, two hemispheres. Uh, these are called Magdeburg hemispheres, and we're just going to put them together. And we're going to remove the air from inside. Hook up our vacuum pump. So we're removing the air with a vacuum pump, and this little scale here tells us the atmosphere, the, the pressure of, of the air inside of the sphere. And I need a volunteer for this one. I need I need a, an adult, like a maybe a dad in the front few rows here. Like you, sir, would you help? Come on down. <laughs> so we remove the air, we close the valve to not let the air back in. How you doing? All right, let's, let's play a little tug of war. Let's see if we can get this apart. Ooh, come on, we can... Oh, that. oh dear. Oh, man, these things, are, these things are really stuck together. So we remove the air. There, there's 15, about 15 pounds per square inch of pressure all over this. That, that's hundreds of pounds of force. So we're not going to get this thing apart. But I have an idea. Let's start pulling and Let me just release this valve and let the air back in. There we go. Thank you. There you go, Mr. Weiss. Thank you very much. And for my final demonstration, um, I want to experiment with, with something uh, called the Bernoulli effect. It's what, it's what helps planes fly here on Earth. We can't fly planes on Mercury. You would just ram right into the side of a mountain. You would knock it off the ground because there's no air. So, Professor Sprott, would you help me with this one? Sure. Uh, Professor Sprott, I bought, went to Lowe's and Home Depot and I bought one of these... Uh, Leaf blower things that you use? Do you know how to use one of these? Well, yeah, I have one of these at home. What do you use these things for? Well, you blow leaves into your neighbor's yard. Oh. <laughs> well, it can make a pretty good scientific uh, a piece of equipment as well because it m moves air in a stream. So let's do a little experiment. Thank you, Professor Sprott. So it wasn't actually the air pushing under the ball that held it up. It was the flow of air around the ball. The Bernoulli effect says moving air has lower pressure, and that's what kept the ball in the stream. Pretty interesting. Well, Professor Sprott, that's everything I brought today. Wait, wait a second. This, this wasn't here when I came out. This, Pluto is a planet. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely preposterous. Mercury is the smallest planet. That's our claim to fame and will always be the smallest planet. Pluto is not a planet. Thank you. Well, the previous visitors were from the inner planets, the ones close to the sun. And our next visitor is from one of the outer planets, Saturn. As you, which is the sixth planet from the sun and the second largest in the solar system. Almost a thousand Earths would fit inside of one Saturn. Now many people recognize Saturn by its beautiful rings, but it's now known to have uh, 60 moons, one of which, Titan, is half as large as the Earth and has a dense atmosphere. 
Uh, Saturn, unlike the inner planets, is made up mostly of hydrogen and helium gas surrounding a small, dense metallic core. Now, despite its large size, the gravity on Saturn is about um, the same as it is here on the Earth. But because Saturn is 10 times farther from the Sun than is the Earth, it's very cold there. Uh, Peter, if you would bring out our visitor from Saturn, Professor Kushkush. Ah, oh, yes, Professor Sprott. He's right here on this cart, a special cart we made for him. And I'll just park it right here. And the only instruction I have is just to plug in this cord right here, just like that. Hi, Professor Kushkush. Did you enjoy the trip? Well, I can't understand the thing he's saying. No, I can't understand anything there either. There must be something wrong with his language translator. Ah. Is there anyone in the audience that speaks Saturnian? I speak Saturnian. Oh, George. Ah. Welcome. Hello. Can you translate? I'd be happy to. Professor Sprott, Pro Professor Kushkush wants to thank you for being here and wants to thank all of you for being here as well. Uh, we're here to talk about sound today. Now you might ask, what does sound have to do with astronomy? Well, it turns out that most of the information that we get from astronomical bodies comes to us in the form of waves. And one of the easiest waves to understand is sound. And if you understand one kind of wave, at some level, you understand most. Now, Professor Kushkush here speaks in a voice that's so high frequency. In other words, it vibrates so fast, we can't hear it. We call that ultrasonic. I have here a demonstration of ultrasonic sound. This device is a, acts both as a speaker and as a microphone. It's called a transducer. And it vibrates at ultrasonic frequencies. And what will happen is I'll get this going, and it will actually catch the vibrations in the water, and it will break the surface of the water into droplets and throw them up into the air. And there you see it. Uh, this is called an ultrasonic mister. Now, with this demonstration, uh, we find an effect that was first discovered by Ernst Kolodny, a scientist from the 1600s, in fact, at 1670. And he's often called the father of modern acoustics, the science of sound. And he took a metal plate such as this, and he drew a bow of a violin along one side of it and got the plate to vibrate in a special way that we call resonance. And he poured common everyday table sand on it. And uh, what will happen is the sand will collect in the places of the plate that are vibrating the least. And you'll get interesting geometrical patterns. So let's see what happens. You'll see how fast the plate is vibrating on the frequency counter there. It's currently vibrating at 482 times per second. And you see the geometric pattern. We can go a little lower. We can go down to 330 times per second. And you can see the pattern changes. We can go higher than that as well. Now we're up about 710 times per second. And so this is called a Kolodny plate. Now, this is interesting because stars vibrate just like this metal plate does. The surface of stars, including the sun, vibrate. And we can study the waves coming from the star in the form of light. And using mathematical techniques that we would use to analyze this, we can infer the kinds of vibrations that we're seeing on the surface of that star. Now, materials vibrate. And here we have a special kind of fluid. This is a solution of cornstarch. And what I will do is I will put, I will vibrate this speaker, which will vibrate the material. And you'll see a pattern of waves form in there. And this was first done in 1870 by the amateur scientist Michael Faraday, who may have been the greatest amateur scientist who's ever lived. And there you can see the pattern of waves. Now, we can increase the frequency, and you'll notice that the pattern changes. And we can decrease it, and the pattern changes again. 
But you'll notice that as long as we keep the frequency steady, despite the fact that this is a fluid, the waves pretty much stay in one place. And when that happens, we call that a standing wave. And this is a special kind of standing wave. In this kind of fluid, when you vibrate it, the fluid almost becomes like a solid. And so we call this a Faraday wave after Michael Faraday. <laughs> Professor Kushkush wishes to thank you, Professor Sprout, for being here, and wishes to thank all of you for being such a gracious audience. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Uh, who are you? Uh, my name is Adam Beardsley. Adam Beardsley? That's a familiar name. Didn't I read a newspaper article about you recently? That's right. You probably read about my discovery. You see, I was in an astronomy class here at UW last semester, and my class discovered a brand new galaxy. Wow, that's impressive. Can you tell us something about it? Sure. The cool thing about our galaxy is that it's located in what's called the zone of avoidance. And to understand what that means, I brought along a couple of pictures to show you. You see, this is the Milky Way, as you can see it from the Earth. And as you can see in the center, there's a lot of light, a lot of stuff, right? Well, if you try to look past the Milky Way, you can see a lot of things around it, but you can't see a lot through it because all that stuff in the center gets in the way. So if you want to look through it, you have to look very hard with a very powerful telescope. And that's exactly what we did. We used this. This is the Arecibo Telescope, and it's located in Puerto Rico. This thing is so big that you could fit three football fields inside of it. And this is exactly what we used to discover a brand new galaxy. Can you tell us something about this galaxy? How far away is it? Sure. It's about 250 million light years away. That means that if we tried to communicate with aliens in this galaxy, it would take over 250 million years for them to get our message. We also know that it's roughly about the same size as our own galaxy. Hmm. Kind of makes you think. Maybe there's an alien physics professor out there somewhere giving on a demonstration show right now. Well, I don't know whether I believe that, but uh, I guess it's possible. Yeah. Well, I must be going. I'm headed to Puerto Rico right now to check out the new galaxy. Have a great show. Thank you. Well, it is true that a group of students in one of our astronomy classes right here at the university discovered a new galaxy. And maybe some of you someday will come to the university and take an astronomy course, and maybe you will have the chance to discover a galaxy. Because students can do that. But our next visitor is from the planet Venus, which is the second planet from the sun and the closest planet to the Earth. Uh, now, Venus is uh, uh, sometimes called our sister planet because it's almost the same size as the Earth and uh, its composition is very similar. But Venus is a very inhospitable place. Uh, it has an atmosphere that's 100 times denser than the atmosphere here on the Earth and it's made up almost entirely of carbon dioxide. Uh, Venus is shrouded by thick clouds of sulfuric acid, and it has 200 mile per hour winds and violent electrical storms, and a surface temperature even hotter than Mercury, reaching 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, because Venus is shrouded by thick clouds, we can't see the surface, but radar images show tall volcanoes and deep valleys. Uh, some people think Venus shows what the Earth might be like someday if global warming continues. Now, because Venus is rather inhospitable to life, our next visitor is a little bit peculiar. His name is Skinny Bar, Skinny Bar, Fat Bar, Fat Bar, Skinny Bar, Skinny Bar. Well, we call him Professor Barcode. Peter, would you bring him out? Ah, uh, yes, Professor Sprott. I was just back at the space dock, and the special delivery, this big metal crate here, they delivered it, put it on some casters for me, and, and they also gave me this really nice 500-page manual. Well, so now, wait a minute. We don't have time for a 500-page manual. People mm. are anxious to see this. Well, you know, I do take some shortcuts around here. And, I've uh, noticed that. Well, so let's try this out. I see this big switch on the side, and I really like switches, so uh -huh. let me just throw it and see what happens. There we go. Ah, yes. Greetings, ethanoids. Beginning speech procedure. Hi, I'm Professor Barcode. And I'm here today to talk to you about the force of electricity. Now, do you remember earlier when Kukus Klukus was talking about the force of gravity? Well, the force of electricity is a lot like the force of gravity, only a billion, 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 billion times stronger. And also, 
unlike gravity, which only pulls things together, gravity can also push things apart. And the way it does this is by having two types. We call them charges. You can have positive charges and negative charges. If you're the same type, positive and a positive, you'll push apart. But if you have a positive and a negative, you'll pull together. But let me uh, not just talk about this. Let me dem have a demonstration. What I have here is a little ball. And I'm going to negatively charge this ball, drop it, and then positively charge my hand and pull it back up before it hits the ground. OK, you ready? You didn't assemble me, did you, Peter? No, I took a shortcut this time. <laughs> well, I have a backup plan. I brought with me from uh, Venus this wand. And I can charge up the end of this wand with negative charges. And I brought with me this metal muff. So I'm going to drop him onto this wand and charge him up with negative charges too. So him and the wand should repel, and I can cause him to fly. So let's see. Oh, there we go. And I can use it to defeat the force of gravity. Now this is something we call static electricity. You might be familiar with this in a few forms. Here, you can catch that. <laughs> a few forms that you can do here on Earth. If you take a balloon and rub it against your fur, Hair, hair, yeah, rub them against your hair. You can stick it to a wall. Also, if it's a cold day and kind of dry out, you can, wearing socks, rub your feet up against the carpet and go up and touch your cat. <laughs> if you do this, please videotape it. <laughs> I have another demonstration of that. I have an electron gun here and uh, a tube here that I can cause to light up. Yes, it does say UW. I bet that stands for University of Wisconsin. No, actually, that stands for University of West Venus. The charging capacitors. Sign, sign, cosine, sign, 3.14159. <laughs> so when I lit up this sign here, it's a red color. So it's not the green color we saw before. And I have two tubes here. This one is filled with a gas called neon. It glows kind of a red orange. And this one is filled with a gas called mercury, and it glows. What color is that? Blue. Blue, purple. Blue, purple, indigo. We're going to go with indigo. So you might ask yourself, OK, how is this useful for me? So let's pretend you're an astronomer, and you're interested in a star that's thousands of light years away, like stars are. You can't exactly get in a rocket ship, travel out there, grab some, come back to your lab, and put it in your mass spectrometer to see what's in there. Well, I could, but I wouldn't want to because that would take too long. And I don't think you guys would live thousands of years because you can't break that universal speed limit, C. So how are you going to figure out what's in that star? Well, it turns out stars are very hot. They have a lot of free electrons moving about. And they can interact with the various gases. So if you look at that star and see this color, see this neon type color, you can say, oh, there's neon in there, or if you see this indigo, you could say, oh, there's mercury in that star. So you can figure out what's in distant stars without actually having to travel there, which is something very useful that Earth astronomers do all the time. But maybe this is a bit far afield. I want to get back to electricity. So one more thing I want to talk about is one of the most wonderful demonstrations of electricity that we have in nature. It happens on my planet. It happens on your planet. So what happens when you have a violent storm and you have clouds? rubbing against each other, and you cause charge separation. Lightning, lightning. Lightning, right. And thunder. <laughs> so I wanted to show you some of this. So uh, Professor Sprott, could you bring in that lightning storm we talked about? Well, we did talk about uh, making a lightning storm in the room here, but uh, everyone would get wet. Ah, yes. Rust. Well, I don't know about that. But we do have something that would demonstrate what lightning uh, looks like. Would you like to see? Uh, yes, most definitely. It's our million volt Tesla coil. Oh, a million it, volts. That'll do nicely. It that, makes lightning bolts. That up there kind of looks like a, uh, a cloud. So why don't we get that moving? Professor Barcode! Professor Barcode! Professor Sprott, something's happened with Professor Barcode. Uh-oh, we must have zapped his electronics with the high voltage. Oh, yes. Well, let me just stick them back in the box here. 
and I'll just put a big return to sender sticker on the crate and put it back on the dock. Okay. <laughs> Well, our next visitor is from the planet Jupiter, which is the fifth planet from the sun and the largest of all the planets. Um, Jupiter is uh, slightly closer to the sun than Saturn is, and, it, and most people don't know, but it has a faint ring system and uh, a very strong magnetic field, much stronger than here on the Earth. Now, unlike Saturn, Jupiter is composed, or like Saturn, Jupiter is composed mostly of hydrogen and helium gas. Uh, but it also is known to have at least 63 moons, one of which, Ganymede, is larger than the planet Mercury. Uh, Jupiter also has a giant red spot that's been there for hundreds of years, and it's bigger than the Earth, and it's thought to be a hurricane. Now, well, Jupiter's gravity is about two and a half times greater than the gravity here on the Earth, and its mass is two and a half times greater than the sum of all of the other planets combined. Now, because of Jupiter's very large magnetic field, we've flown in from the cloud city of a specialist in magneto-navigation, Professor Krakow. <laughs> sorry, sorry there. I'm just having a little trouble feeling where I'm going. Your, your magnetic field is so small here. Well, I think I'm getting used to it. This, this, this will work out. Oh, yes, magnetism. I was brought to talk about magnetism. As you all know, it is very difficult to travel in a straight line, especially over long distances, like when you migrate south in the winter, without using your magnetic sensing organ to follow the field lines. Isn't that right, Professor Spratt? Well, no, actually, we humans don't migrate. <laughs> No, and, and we don't have magnetic sensor organs. No. How do you survive? I have so much to learn. Well, uh, maybe we can learn from each other here today because I brought several demonstrations to teach you about magnetism. I'd like to start with something I know that no one in this room has ever seen before. We just discovered this on Jupiter a year ago. That would be about 12 of your Earth years. So I like to call it a permanent magnet. And if I take it near certain metal objects like these nails, I can lift them. You've never seen anything like that before, right, Professor? We've had permanent magnets on the Earth for hundreds of years. <laughs> Ruffle my feathers. You're kidding. No. Well. If you're used to these, maybe I'll show you something else. Oh, over here, I brought a demonstration of something I like to call a temporary magnet. In this device, we have a coil of wire, and we're going to pass some electric current through that wire. And what that'll do is create a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field that forms very quickly, and it gets pushed through the center of this aluminum ring. So as you may know, Aluminum is not a magnetic material. It doesn't stick to a magnet at all. But when I push a magnetic field through here very quickly, it will become a temporary magnet. And that temporary magnet will be aligned in the opposite direction of the magnetic field we started with. So it's a bit like putting two north ends of magnets together. Do you know what happens when two north ends get pushed together? No. Yeah, shout it out. What happens? They repel. They repel, I heard someone say. Well, let's see. If that's right, then when I push this button, the rings should create, be a temporary magnet and repel up into the air. Shall we try it? Yeah. OK, three, two, one. Did you see it? I'll do it again. Ready? Here we go. Now, oh, that's pretty neat, but it's not very impressive, is it? I think. We can do a little better. Here, I have a big piece of iron. Now, if I take this and put it through the middle, we should increase the magnetic field that we're pushing through that ring, which will make the reaction, the repelling action, much stronger. And the ring should go higher. Think we should try it? Yeah. OK, here we go. Three, two, one. <laughs> You 
y'all, you earthlings, have come up with a crazy idea. And I uh, saw some liquid nitrogen out here earlier in the show. And uh, you earthlings have come up with a theory that if you get a metal like this aluminum cold enough, like to the temperature of liquid nitrogen, it will become a much better conductor. Now, what I didn't tell you about this device before was that the reason this, mag this ring produces a magnetic field is because when I push the magnetic field through in the beginning, it creates a current that flows through the ring. And that current creates the temporary magnet. So when I get this ring much colder, it should in increase the ring's conductivity, which will make a larger current which will make a larger magnetic field in the opposite direction. And so maybe we can get it to go even higher. Should we try? Yeah. OK. I need to wait just a minute more until the ring stops boiling. When the, when the liquid nitrogen stops boiling, we know that the ring is at the temperature of liquid nitrogen and is cold enough. That looks like it's just about ready. Nice and cold. And here we go. Three, two, one. You want to see it again? Yeah? With the. OK. I've never done this before, though. Those of you in the front row might want to duck your heads. We'll see what happens here. Nice cold ring. And it's a little difficult to pick up. I don't want to stick my hands in there because I might freeze my fingers off. There we go. See what happens. OK, look out below. Three, two, one. And in this last device here, I want to show you, we've created a very special pair of magnets. And these have coils wrapped around them and current flowing in opposite directions. And they've been specially made to work with this special piece of aluminum to create just the situation to achieve something called magnetic levitation. <laughs> That's not the only object we can levitate. We can also do it to this aluminum cylinder. I remind you that aluminum is not a magnetic material, and yet we can levitate it using nothing but the magnetic forces created by these magnets and the currents induced inside the cylinder. You know, I've heard you earthlings have gotten very creative with this concept. You've used these magnetic levitation to levitate other objects, such as a living frog. And also, really big things like a passenger train, if you believe it. So you can see that magnetic levitation may have some really neat technological advantages in the future. Something to watch out for. So I want to show you one last demonstration here that uh, involves a little bit different situation. In all the previous ones, we've had a stationary magnetic field that we use to create a temporary magnet using a piece of aluminum which moves the aluminum in some dire direction. In this last demonstration, we have the same thing, but with a twist. We've got a very strong permanent magnet and a stationary conductor. In this case, it's copper, but it's a lot like aluminum, a little bit better conductor. And in this case, we'll have a moving magnet and a stationary conductor. And you can see that the same principles apply. When the magnet gets close, it will induce what are called eddy currents to flowing in this copper piece. And we'll see what happens if I push it over. Watch closely. Did you see what happened? Yeah. It falls a little bit slower near the end. In fact, I can even drop it from a few inches above. And it slows down for the last inch or so of its fall. 
Well, you know, I want to play one, one more time with this idea of your earthling scientists, that if you cool a, a, a piece of metal down, it will be a better conductor. So here, I have exactly the same copper plate, but cooled down to the temperature of liquid nitrogen. And I think, if my calculations are correct, the effect should be even stronger in this situation. Let's watch. I can even hold it up and drop it and maybe for a brief moment achieve another form of magnetic levitation. Wow. Isn't this thing neat? It's so shiny, it's so strong, so bright. It's really cool. Whoa! Um, maybe I got a little close there. I think this probably ought to be the end of my presentation. I gotta go sit down. Thank you! Well, you know, Professor Sprott, do you think he went back to Jupiter to hatch some new ideas? Hmm. I don't know about that, but he didn't lay an egg when he was here. Hmm. Well, our last visitor is from Pluto, which, as you know, used to be considered a planet until the year 2006, when astronomers decided to reclassify it as a dwarf planet because of its small size and rather unusual orbit. Uh, we now know that there are other dwarf planets in the solar system. Now, because Pluto is very far from the sun, as you might expect, it's very cold there. And it has very little gravity, and it has a very thin atmosphere. Uh, Jupiter, or sorry, Pluto is slightly smaller than our moon, and it has a surface with many craters. Um, in fact, there are five moons in the solar system that are bigger than Pluto. Well, our guest from Pluto is named Pluta. And I think she's been here before. We brought you here to talk about physics, not to protest the status of Pluto. Well, you know, I only get to talk about physics for about 10 minutes. And I can protest about Pluto all day long. Since after all, you know, you demoted us to dwarf planet, and then you invited us to an interplanetary conference on physics. Doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense. I'm a little concerned that you maybe think you're better than we are as humans versus Plutonians. So I just wanted to correct the record of Professor Barcode earlier, who seems to have made a mistake in what he was telling you. Um, if you would be so kind as to turn on the lamp over there, the one you think he called indigo, perhaps. Um, that is actually not indigo. Now we on Pluto see colors as they actually are, not as you see them, which is all the colors together. So I can see this, which is that that lamp is actually a little bit of purple, a little bit of blue, a little green, orange maybe. Um, and that's why I wear these glasses, so I can see the way you do. But so you can see the way we do up there. Uh, we have a camera here with a little light splitter on it um, pointing at that lamp. So he wasn't really telling the full truth. That's not really indigo. It's really a number of different colors all together. That's the same type of thing that happens with a rainbow. A rainbow works, um, well, obviously for a rainbow you need the sun and the rain together. Just the rain doesn't make a rainbow and just the sun doesn't make a rainbow either. Um, so we have a sun and something that's kind of like a raindrop here. And the raindrops work as the light splitter and they separate the sunlight into all of its constituent parts. And that's what we see. We see the pure colors on Pluto because, you know, we are much better than you guys here. So now we have a lot of other things that we're better than you guys at. So I brought some photos to show you. If you look up here, we have, for example, well, focus your eyes in the middle of the right one or the middle of the left one. Um, and you can see that they, they turn on their own. Now, these gears are really useful because if you put them in your watch, you know, you never have to wind your watch ever again, right? Well, that's pretty handy. So, and we also have three-pronged magnets. We use these in the lab all the time. You guys only have two, two ends because you only have two poles. Well, we have three. Um, we also have some ink that you can only see if you're not looking at it. 
We use it for military purposes. I think your military might find this very useful. And we also have a perpetual motion machine that we started about 200 no, years ago. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Professor Sprout, are you believing any of this? No, there's no such thing as a perpetual motion machine. You think well, we are things are stupid? if you don't believe me, then I'll show you something in real life. So I noticed on my way in that there's this fancy demonstration here, and this will allow me to show you what we do on Pluto to make fire under extreme conditions. See, we, uh, it's really cold there, right? So we've learned to make fire and heat under, you know, when it's cold and, and sometimes when it's wet, too. So I'm going to show you how we make fire under water. Now, you're going to have to excuse my sunshade. It's really cold out there and, and we don't get a lot of light, so if I remove it, I might melt. And that would be a little bit tragic, I think. Maybe disturbing for some of the audience members. <laughs> But if you look up on the screen, it should be pretty clear as soon as I move. You'll be able to see the candle under the water. Now, isn't that cool? Don't you wish you could do that here? Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's no candle burning under the water. The candle is out there, and the water is back here. Look. No. Look. You weren't supposed to be able to see that. That's not fair. Well, I, I suppose now I have to tell you how it works. There's a candle here, there's the water there, and, and there's this glass plate in the middle. And you can see through the glass plate, which allows you to see the water, just like that. And it also reflects light, especially when we turn the lights out. Uh, so then you can see the candle reflected really well. Well, that's something that we call an illusion, and I, maybe you know what an illusion is. It's something that seems one way and it's actually another way. And maybe you guessed, but those, those photos I showed you earlier, those were illusions too. Now this is a bit of a sticky situation because we really didn't think you Earthlings were that smart. So we didn't think you'd catch on. But, well, I guess I might as well tell you, my last demonstration is also an illusion. Um, so maybe, maybe instead of trying to pass it off as real, we'll let you guess and see just how smart you actually are. But I'm going to need a volunteer. Ah, your hand was the fastest. I guess you'll have to come. Um, so, are you ready to have your head cut off? Sure. Sure? Okay, well, excellent. So, if Professor Spratt and Mr. Wikes would be so kind as to hold up this red cloth here, I would be happy to put your head on this plate. Um, so, all we need to do is get you to stand here and put your head there and let me just get out my knife. We'll perform the surgery and make a couple incisions. One here, one there. Uh-oh, don't move now. I might cut your head off, actually. <laughs> oh, oh, you know, you, you better, better go. Yeah, yep, just like that. Otherwise, I might cut the wrong thing. Okay, so now let's see. Okay, so there we go. I think he might even still be alive. Wouldn't that be handy? Okay, so let's let's see it. Now, what was your name? Michael. And Michael, how old are you? I'm You're 13, and you don't mind having your head cut off. No, I don't. No, no. Okay, well that's good. So maybe we should quit while we're ahead. Um, maybe you've guessed the illusion. Can you see it? There's a mirror under here, isn't there? Now, now where is the mirror? Is it, is it here? No, it's, it's diagonal, isn't it? If you don't make it diagonal, it doesn't create the right effect. So, yes, let's, let's get you out of here. Aha. Uh -huh. Can you see? He's alive! Well, that's a bit surprising. We really didn't think you Earthlings were smart enough to figure it out. So, hmm. Well, I suppose the only option left is for you guys to upgrade yourselves to dwarf planet status so that everybody else will know that you're just as smart as we are. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? I think that's the right answer. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me. Have a good night.
Well, you know, there is a lot of physics in magic. To be a good magician, you have to know some physics. In fact, you know the difference between a magician and a physicist? They both do interesting demonstrations, but the magician never tells you how it works. The physicist, you can't get them to shut up about it. <laughs> but anyway, so far as we know, the only place in the solar system where life really exists is right here on the Earth, the third planet from the sun. But you know, the universe is a very large place with something like 100 billion galaxies, each with 10 to 100 billion stars. And um, we now know that many of these stars have planets. And some of these planets almost certainly have conditions conducive to life, maybe even intelligent life. And so it's possible that life exists in many places throughout the universe. But most of those places, most of those places are very far away. And it's very unlikely that we'll ever come in contact with an alien from another uh, distant galaxy. Uh, but you know, the Earth is a very special place. Uh, it's teeming with life of enormous variety. And that's because the Earth is neither too hot nor too cold. But like Goldilocks, it's just right for the existence of liquid water, which of course is what we need uh, to support life. However, humans are doing things that threaten the climate and other conditions here on, light, on the Earth. And it's possible that uh, someday, maybe the Earth would not be able to support life. So we humans have to be very careful to preserve the conditions that allow us to be sitting here today learning about the wonders of physics. And now I'd like to conclude the way we have concluded every one of the shows for the past 26 years, by making for you a cloud the kind of cloud that exists in the solar system only right here on Earth, a cloud of condensed water vapor. And in order to do that, I bring out a container that has 25 liters of liquid nitrogen. We force nitrogen gas into it. That forces the liquid to come out these holes on the top. That cools the air. The water vapor in the air then condenses into tiny droplets of liquid water. And that's what we call a cloud. And so with that, I will put on my hat and thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm.